Anybody just excited by the Word of God this morning and just being able to receive something? Man, we love the Word of God at Rescue House Church, and it's going to be powerful. Hey, just before we jump in, though, I don't really want to stifle the spirit this morning, but I just, I'm believing God's going to do something awesome. But I do just want to say, next weekend, you got to be in the house. It's a 100% weekend. We want everybody in the house. We want to take this pipe and drape down uh, so bad next week. So you got to invite people, and you got to be here in the house next weekend. Everybody gets a free t-shirt, and there's a lot of vision casting that's going on, where we're going, what we're doing, how you play a part into that, and um, I'm just excited to kind of share uh, a lot of that with you. So we're excited. Uh, it's a, like Pastor Chris was saying, it's a new thing. God's doing a new thing in our house, and we're excited about it. Leading up to revival, we believe that revival is not going to be worth anything unless we bathe it in prayer. Amen. How many people know before you come into revival, before you come into a season where you're going to try to hear from God at a new level, you got to prepare your heart. And so we're going to do 21 days of prayer starting this Thursday. Okay. So that'll be 21 days until the revival starting this Thursday. And on our social media outlets, uh, we're going to be kind of posting and letting you know things that we need to be praying for, things that you be praying for, for your kids, for your family, for your own heart. Just so that we don't show up to revival and like, oh, it's here. It's like, nah, we've been preparing for this. We're ready for this. We know God is going to speak to us, and it's at that level that we're going to lean in. And man, when you do that, when you perceive it that way, you're going to receive it at a higher level. So I'm excited about 21 days of prayer uh, starting this Thursday on our social media outlet. So just make sure you're kind of doing that. And if you don't have Facebook, it's 2017, y'all. Do something, get it. Or just ask your mom. She's probably on Facebook, okay? So... Today we start a new series called A Black Sheep, and I'm excited about this because in many ways I've felt like a black sheep. I know that there are a lot of people under the sound of my voice in this room who may have felt like out of place or uh, just like you didn't fit the mold, or maybe you haven't never just kind of followed the mainstream. You've kind of been more of a trendsetter. You want to be different. Uh, how many have ever felt like a black sheep at times during your life? Anybody? Maybe with your own family? Yeah, everybody here. So what's exciting about that is this series is going to resonate with you because the reality is when you look at God's word, it's not the best looking, it's not the most uh, educated, it's not the, the most well-spoken person that God uses, it's not the prettiest, it's not the valedictorian, it's not those people, no offense Pastor Austin, he's valedictorian, I knew when I said that he's going to think, yeah, he's talking about me, dude is smart, out of his mind, but God still uses you, okay, like you're a, little, you're a black sheep in different ways, you got tattoos, okay, so like... Uh, We'll just pull that out. And that, who knows a valedictorian that gets tattoos? Nobody. Pastor Austin. All right? So you know him. Um, but God doesn't want to, in my opinion, to look at the best of the best and the greatest of the greatest. Like, it, it's always God using the people who are the outcasts, the people who are maybe not the good enough in many people's eyes. I mean, really, uh, write this down. This is so important. God chooses often the people that the world refuses. So God chooses what the world refuses. And so that's counterculture to our society because the world wants the best of the best, the best personality, the best looking, the best athlete, the again, the most educated. And I know there are some people in here, you're like, well, well that's me. Well, I've got good news for you. God can actually still use you at some point in your life if you'll just become a black sheep. Amen? Anybody? Anybody? Because God specializes in using black sheep for his glory. I felt like this many times in my life, and it's no secret to our church if you're new here, you're a VIP, or I've met a lot of people that are new to our house, and maybe this is your second time coming, third time coming, maybe you haven't been coming for a month. I need to catch you up to speed on this, and that is that my mom put me in beauty pageants as a kid, and uh, my dad would actually stand in the back and film it with his old VHS-like camera, uh, to which I'm like, Dad, what was the deal there? And he's like, I was just doing what your mama told me. I'm like, okay, all right. Smart man, right? Like, smart man. Uh, and, and so for many of those years, like, while everybody else was playing Little League football and everybody else was playing t-ball and, and they were playing sports like every, like, boy does, right? Like, your boy was with a Speedo winning Mr. Hawaiian Tropic in South Carolina and Myrtle Beach, okay? So that's just, that's what your boy was doing while everybody else was doing their thing. Uh, at some point, I'll post a picture for you. I promise it's like for real. But 
um, I, I felt like a black sheep oftentimes. I felt, I was reminded of this in, in Moxville. It's kind of a small town. Everybody kind of knows each other. And they have a paper there called the Davie County Enterprise. Uh, we actually call it the surprise because it's really never a surprise. But it's just kind of play on words, whatever. And, and the sports writer, has he's been the sports writer since I was a kid. His name is Brian Pitts. And he's got his own Facebook. And recently what he's been doing is going back through the archives of the papers in the 80s, the 90s, and in the early 2000s. And he's finding all these great sports moments and these great sports players. And he's, he's, he's archiving and posting them on Facebook. Now, I played some sports in Davie County. And I wasn't like the best of the best. But, like, I had some games. You know what I'm saying? I had my 21 points. I, I made the paper and, the, and the, the selected part of the paper where it was like, man, you need to know this guy did something special. And I've been there. And so I've just been waiting for him. And I'm friends with him. So I know at some point he's going to find my archive, you know. And he's going to put it. <laughs> on Facebook, and he's going to put it, you know, out there for everybody to see, and everybody's going to comment, oh, I remember that, man, when you just, like, came through, hit the game-winning shot, I remember it, right, and I'm, like, waiting, you know, it's been, like, months, I'm, like, waiting, I ain't even hit him up yet, but I'm about to hit you up, like, where's my archive, and then, bam, there it is, somebody say, whoop, there it is, right, like, 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 there it is, but it wasn't of me playing sports, it was of me singing, take me out to the ball game <laughs> at the fifth grade elementary talent show. <laughs> For everybody to see. Like, everybody else has got their sports moments sliding into home, hitting the game-winning shot, and Matt gets take me out to the ball game. <laughs> and everybody's commenting, ha, 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 ha. I just want to bust through something, you know? And I felt, I felt like, it took me back to the days where I felt like a black sheep. Like, mom put me in beauty pageants. I'm singing at talent shows. I'm singing at these tops conventions. And I can't even sing. Yet, mom has me doing this. And then, but then immediately I started thinking, you know what? That was actually God not punishing me. It was God preparing me to be a pastor one day, to stand on the stage so that I wouldn't be, you know, stage fright. And I could preach God's word. And I could bring forth a word of victory. And I could connect with you and introduce you to Jesus. Jesus, come on, somebody. Yeah. Black sheep. And I just said, uh, like, that's kind of where I got this series from. I was like, man, I, I was like a black sheep in my circle of friends. In fact, many of my friends made fun of me. I went on to create this little skit drama group that would travel and perform to over like 100,000 people in like six years and all, in high school, okay? Now, these do, that, that's not the popular thing to do. And I mean, I got made fun of like crazy at a high level. And again, it was just God preparing me to actually reach and come back home. And I never saw it and I never knew it because when you leave Davie County or even the triad, you're like, I'm never coming back home again. Like I'm going, I went to Nashville, like I'm going to stay in Nashville. And yet God was preparing me the whole time the whole time to come back and to introduce the very people who were making fun of me, to introduce those people to Jesus. And it's amazing how many of my friends that would gave me a hard time actually never had a relationship with Jesus until we, until we started Rescue House Church. And it's just amazing how God uses black sheep. In fact, when you read the Bible, it's not the best of the best. It's the black sheep of the Bible that God uses, the people that no one else would like. Think. It's like, man, you, you going you gonna to use her? You ever gotten that face, right? You going to use him? What? That's who God uses in his word. So if you've ever felt like rejected, if you've ever felt like you don't fit the mold, like you, you live a little differently, you don't follow the mainstream, guess what? You're in great company today, and there is great potential for you to be used by God. And that's where we're going with this series. I hope you're excited about it. We're going to be talking about some different characters throughout the Bible. Today our assignment is Joseph of the Old Testament, okay? Joseph, this is not Christmas Joseph, okay? This isn't earthly Jesus' dad. This is uh, Joseph of the Old Testament, the coat of many colors. And for those of you who have been in church for a very long time, that's how you would know this Joseph. This Joseph went through, you know, tragedies. He went through triumphs. 
through it all, he always treasured God. No matter if it was a tragedy, no matter if it was triumph, he always treasured God in the midst of everything. He never allowed his circumstances or his situations to shape his view of who God was. And so in the Bible, when you read Genesis chapter 37 through chapter 50, that's 13 chapters, is the story of Joseph. Now, I, we ain't got time today, okay? We don't have time to go through 13 chapters today, but that is actually your homework. That's what I want you to write down. I want you to go in this week, you don't have to read it all in one sitting, but I want you to read Genesis 37 through Genesis 50. Clap your hands if you, you're going to give it an attempt, all right? Give it an attempt, all right? I want you to read that story. Now, we don't have time to kind of dive into it, so I'm going to be kind of jumping around, but actually Psalm 105 kind of tucks it down nice and neat for us and puts it in about six verses. So I want to read that, and then we're going to jump in, all right? Psalm 105, 16 through 22. And listen, I'm just going to warn you today. I'm not going to try to be that funny. I'm going to try to tell this story in a powerful way. This is the story of Joseph from the Old Testament, total black sheep of his family, and God totally uses him for, for his glory, and it's just powerful stuff, some truths today. For those of you who have been in church for a very long time, you've been a Christian, hey, your prayer needs to be, God, show me something new today. How many people know you can read the same story a hundred times with the Bible, and it's alive and active and will speak to you in your situation and circumstance differently than you've ever read it before because it's alive and active speaking to you. So that needs to be your prayer today, not, oh, I've heard this story a thousand times, and, you know, I'm not really going to get anything out of it. No, you're going to get something new today if you'll lean in. So Psalm 105, the psalmist says this right here. He's recalling uh, the story of Joseph. He says, he called up for a famine on the land of Canaan, cutting off its food supply. Then he sent someone. If you have a Bible, if you have your iPhone out, that word sent is a word that you just need to, like, underline. We're going to come back to that later. Then he sent someone to Egypt ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with fetters, that just simply means chains, and placed his neck in an iron collar until the time came to fulfill his dreams. The Lord tested Joseph's character. Then Pharaoh sent for him and set him free. The ruler of the nation opened his prison door. Joseph was put in charge of all the king's household. He became ruler over all the king's possessions, and he could instruct the king's aides as he pleased and, and, and teach the king's advisor. So this is a guy, when all is said and done, I love how the psalm just kind of summarizes it and kind of puts it all down. And we're going to kind of go over this story. We're going to look in Genesis in just a minute and kind of skip through those 13 chapters really quick today because I don't have a lot of time. But I want to preach a message to you today called From the Pit to the Palace. From the Pit to the Palace. And I'm telling you, as a black sheep, as a follower of Jesus, man, Oftentimes to get to the palace, you got to go through the pit. Somebody say amen. amen. Right? you got to go through some things, some ups and downs, and that was Joseph's story. And so, but by the end of this story, uh, the psalm kind of tucks it in nice and neat and summarizes it. And by the end of it, Joseph, check it out. This is the end of the story. Joseph is second in command uh, in Egypt, which is the, the, the wealthiest nation in the world at that time. Second in command. So he's kind of like the vice president. That's where he gets to. He's also, many scholars believe he's the second most wealthiest man in Egypt uh, and really all of the world. He's in a position where he gets to tell the king's aides and elders and advisors what to do. He's over the whole palace and over all of the possessions and can do with them what he wants. By the end of this story, he saved two countries from starvation and bankruptcy. And then the most important one of all is that God used him to save the nation of Israel, which is where we get Jesus from. God did more in Joseph's life than he could ever dream of or imagine. And Joseph was a dreamer. That's, a, that's what he was. In fact, we'll see how his brothers called him that. And yet God did immeasurably more simply because... Whether it was tragedy or triumph, he chose to treasure God. We know we're treasured by God. Don't we, Rescue House? We know we're treasured by him. Now we're moving into a season where we've got to understand that he is Lord and that we'll treasure him no matter if it's tragedy or triumph, whether it's the valley or the mountaintop. No circumstance, no situation is going to shape my view of God and how obedient I am 
to God. And we see that with Joseph, and that's why he ended up where he was. But the summary uh, in Psalm is pretty, but the story in Genesis is painful. The summary in Psalm is miraculous, but the story in Genesis is messy. The summary in Psalm that we just read is about what God did, but the story in Genesis reveals how he did it. And so I want to spend the rest of our time talking about how God did it through Joseph and how Joseph remained faithful even in uh, the midst of trying circumstances uh, and situations. So we're going to start Genesis 37, 3 through when we're going down, just write the reference down if you want to go back and read this. So I'm going to give you a lot of, uh, I'm going to jump around, jump through this story, Genesis 37 through 50. So we're going to kind of hit some highlights. So I don't want you to actually fumbling through or you're, I'm going to lose you. Because listen, I need you to get this whole story. I don't need you to bow out for two minutes because then you're going to miss it. And then you're going to go, oh crap, like how am I going to get back? And then you need to hear this whole thing. So you got to lean in today, okay? Amen? you got to lead into the, lean into the Bible and uh, watch him speak to you. Here we go. Genesis 37, 3 and 4. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. So Israel is Joseph's dad. And he says that he loved him more than his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. Turn to your neighbor and say, hello. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Verse 5, Joseph had a dream because he was a dreamer. And when he told it to his brothers, which was dumb, that's not in the Bible, I just made that up. Uh, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down. To it. Now, one thing you have to understand is that Joseph, at this point in time that we're reading, he didn't have a Bible, okay? He didn't have the Word of God. And so oftentimes how God would speak to his people, not through the Word because they didn't have it, they were kind of, in fact, writing the Word as they were going, God would often speak to his people through dreams. Now, I believe that God never or has never stopped speaking through dreams I just believe I can't remember my dreams. Anybody? Like, I cannot remember a single dream. Like, literally, I think I had three dreams last night, and I can't remember one of them, right? Like, now, now I have met people, and these people are a little weird, but, I mean, it is what it is. They're like, you know, I just, I know God speaks to me through my dreams, and I can interpret every dream. And I've had people come to me and be like, you know, I just, I was out, I was in a boat in the middle of the sea, and, I was like naked and I was like eating fruity pebbles and like pastor can you interpret that dream I'm like dude here's my interpretation uh, you drink too much buddy okay like you drink too much you've been kicking it back a little too much and the Lord is telling you you need to give up your alcohol okay that's like that's my interpretation right like so you get people that are on all different sides of the spectrum the reality is God still speaks through dreams. I believe that. Uh, I think it takes a special person to interpret them. Me, that's not me. I'm just going to hear the word of God. I'm going to read the word of God. And he speaks to me in different ways. But that's how he primarily spoke to his people back then. And he's speaking to Joseph. And the dream is true. The dream is, hey, your family, your brothers, eventually they're going to bow down to you. I know you feel like the black sheep right now. And you're the youngest. And you're kind of, you know, everybody else is older. And you feel like a black sheep, but one day the tables are going to turn and your whole family is going to bow down to you. And Joseph wouldn't keep his mouth shut. He went on to tell him a second dream, which is the same thing about the moon and the stars and the sun. And that represent his father and mother and his brothers and that they would bow down to him. And his father kind of got upset, was like, hey, you really think we're all going to bow down to you? Like, I mean, he was his favorite, but still it was like, why do you keep opening your mouth? Like if Joseph had a friend he needed a friend in that moment to tell him to shut up and just quit telling your dreams. Just keep your dreams to yourself, right? But he just wouldn't do that. He kept opening up his, his mouth. And so even though the dreams and the interpretations of the dreams that he got were of God, um, he needed to be humbled. Because we see that in Joseph. Joseph is like just telling him these dreams, one day you're going to bow down to me, basically. And, oh, and you like my 
coat of many colors, right? Like, he needed to be humble. The Bible is very clear throughout principles that those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And so he's about to be humbled. As one day, uh, Israel, Joseph's dad, says, hey, I want you to go check on your brothers. Uh, just go check on them, go find them, figure out what's going on. They go, the brothers see Joseph coming, and they, and they say, oh, here comes that dreamer. They start making fun of him, like he's the black sheep. And in fact, what they do is they actually capture him, tie him up, beat him up, and they throw him in a pit. A more specific uh, example is they threw him in a cistern, which is about 15 to 20 feet deep and about 4 feet wide. It's basically just a pit in the ground that people would make. And so they threw him down in this pit so they could figure out what to do with him because they were arguing, do we kill him? You know? Some of them wanted to kill him. One brother spoke up and said, no, we don't need to, like, kill him. We just need to kind of figure this out, like, what we want to do with him. He's the black sheep, and he thinks he's better than us. And he's saying that one day we're going to bow down to him. And this is um, a, an important principle for everybody here. And I've told you this before, but I want to say it again. We've got a lot of new people who are part of our house. Tragedy doesn't make an appointment. Tragedy doesn't call you up and is like, hey, I just want to let you know next week, Wednesday at 3 o'clock, you're going to hit the pit. Right? Like, it's just not going to do that. In fact, in the middle of me speaking this morning at the Moxville campus, there was a woman who, like, got up and was, like, very upset. And I was like, did I say something? Like, what? Because I can see everybody and I can see your faces. But the reality was they were texting me afterwards. She just found out in the experience that her mom died and passed away. As I was speaking about tragedy doesn't make an appointment. At some point, you're going to hit the pit, <laughs> you know? The pit is the thing where, like, the bottom falls out. Like, it, like, falls out. Like, it happens, and it doesn't happen without, with an appointment, for sure. I think about my line of work, and uh, there are some people that, you know, I look to, and um, some people don't realize a lot of things that, like, pastors go through, and, like, that's cool, whatever, uh, but I've got, like, some circle of pastors that, like, I've kind of run with, and there was this one guy, his name is Davey Blackburn, I've never met him, but he had run in some of the same pastor circles uh, that I have, and so I kind of know him through other people, but about a year and a half ago, he, uh, he had planted a church in Indianapolis about three years ago, um, and a year and a half ago, um, he uh, had went to the gym early in the morning, about 6 o'clock, uh, worked out from 6 to 7, returned home only to find out that his wife had been raped and shot in the head, and their little boy was just up in the crib, and basically these two thugs had come in and robbed and, and, and raped and just turned his world upside down. And boom, he's an incredible guy planted a church, walking beside of people, discipling people, and boom, the pit hits him. I think about Levi Lusco. He's just a pastor I like and listen to. And um, About three years ago, three and a half years ago, just all of a sudden, his daughter, three-year-old daughter, starts to have an asthma attack. And they kind of get to the hospital thinking it's not that big of a deal. It's a big deal, and her, his daughter ends up passing away, just like that. For some of you older people who maybe followed Charles Stanley, that dude hit the pit when out of nowhere, like, he gets a divorce. And you think in that moment when you hit the pit, like, God, man, God can't use me. And then most recently, um, the person that, it, you have to understand, I didn't grow up with a pastor. I grew up in churches where these are preachers, okay? And they didn't really think of themselves as pastors, as people who would pastor and shepherd and walk beside of people. Um, and so I felt like I never really had a pastor um, growing up. And so the closest thing I ever had to a pastor uh, was Perry Noble. Um, I was in his coaching network and went to Israel with him. And it wasn't like I had his phone number and just call him up or anything like that. But, man, I learned more about being a pastor from Pastor Perry Noble than anybody else. And if you know his story over the last year and a half, that dude has hit the pit. A lot because of the choices he made, and he would own that and admit that. But the reality is, the pit doesn't make an appointment. And, and in a moment, Pastor Perry 
loses his wife and turns to alcohol and has to go to rehab. He loses his church of 35,000 people and gets removed and gets fired publicly and he hits the pit. And I just wanted to share some of that with you just to say, one, I need you to pray for me, okay? <laughs> I need you to pray for me uh, and my wife and my kids. I want to be a pastor that just has longevity and is here in 25, 30 years. I want to make it. Uh, it's very difficult, and the odds are against me to do that. So I would just covet your prayers on that. Uh, but the second reason I tell you that is as black sheep, you're going to hit a pit. Like you're going to hit a time where the bottom just falls out. The girl's name is Molly this morning, if you want to pray for her. But Molly walked out today not knowing that she was going to hit the pit. She hit the pit while we were talking about hitting the pit. And so there are different reasons we hit the pit, because of circumstances that happen to us and choices that we make. Circumstances and choices both suck and both hurt. But God, I believe, wants to use the pit to lead us to our purpose. Amen? And so we've got to have a higher perspective in the pit. We've got to be willing to say, all right, this is where I'm at. I don't know how I'm going to get out, but God has not given up on me. God loves me. He has greater plans for me, and he said he would always be with me. And if you know those truths, man, it'll get you through the pit. For the rest of our time, I want to look at uh, five things that you're going to go through at some point. If you're a fully devoted follower of Jesus, at some point you're going to go through these emotions. You're going to go through these feelings. You're going to go through these things, five things that you will feel at some point during your lifetime as you follow Jesus. And if you choose to be a black sheep, you choose to say, hey, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live differently. I'm not going to fit. Follow the world. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow what God has for me. You're going to feel these things, all right? And so I, I'm preparing you today. Amen? You might not need this today when you walk out of here, but you might need this a year from now. You might need this five years from now. And so this is someone you want to tuck away. All right, number one thing that you're probably going to feel at some point during your life, if you follow Jesus the right way, is you're going to f- you're going to feel lonely. You're going to feel loneliness. Now, I know that we shouldn't feel lonely because, you know, and I've preached this before because Jesus, you know, sticks closer than a brother and uh, we shouldn't feel lonely. But the reality is, at times you're going to feel that emotion. I know that Joseph felt lonely. You know why? Because he was alone in the pit by himself and his brothers had betrayed him and thrown him in. The people who were supposed to love him the most hated him the most and threw him into the pit alone. But oftentimes you have to understand that some of the greatest places of isolation bring the greatest revelation, right? Like, I mean, it's the times when I'm alone that God's got my full attention, that he wants to speak to me at the highest level. So sometimes we got to thank God for the loneliness, right? we got to thank God for the isolation because that's when God's going to speak to you the most. And when you have that, so if you're in here and you're like, man, I feel alone, which I know in a group this size, there are some people in here, you feel that way right now. And you need a perspective change. It's an opportunity for you to hear from God like you've never heard from God before because he's got your full attention. And so God uses the pit to acclimate you to his presence. And when that happens, man, that's powerful stuff. Number two, you're going to feel doubt. Do I know that Joseph doubted? Of course he doubted. He was in a pit. He was in a cistern 20 feet deep going, how did I get here? I thought these were people who were supposed to bow down to me. The people who were supposed to bow down to me actually threw me down here. And how in the world, he can't see the future. He doesn't know how it's all going to work out. He doesn't see the palace at this point. All he sees is the pit. And we think in the pit, God owes us an explanation. And he doesn't. In fact, if God tried to explain it to you, you probably wouldn't understand it anyway, right? Right? Do I have any parents in here that's ever tried to explain some things to your two-year-old child? And you're like, what? Like, even if I told you, even if I explained this to you, you're not going to understand. And so it's not like God gets annoyed with us when we ask why or ask those questions. He just looks back and he goes, you're not going to understand. So you, you don't need to be asking for reason. You need to be asking for revelation. Don't be asking for explanation. Come on, somebody. You need to be asking for revelation. Who are you, God? What are you trying to do in my life? How are you trying to lead me? How are you trying to shape me and mold me? What would you like for me to give up so that I can pursue you at a higher level? Man, I want some revelation in the pit. I don't need reason. And the last thing.
last thing I would say about doubt is don't ever doubt in the dark what God spoke to you in the light. That's good, ain't it? No, don't do it. Because Joseph was given the dream in the light. God spoke to him in the light, and now he's in the dark. And the gravitational pull for us as followers of Jesus is to doubt in the dark what God said to me in the light. Hey, if it was true in the light, it's true in the dark. Amen? God hasn't left you. God hasn't forsaken you. He said he will be with you. He's God Emmanuel. And we see that throughout this. We see oftentimes, we're about to see this too, that God was with Joseph in the pit. God was with Joseph in the prison. God was with Joseph every step of the way. And if that's the only thing you get out of this message today is that I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how I got here. I don't know what's being done to me. I know I might be the sum of my decisions, but I know that my God is with me and he said he would never leave me nor forsake me. If that's all you get out of today, I'm glad you came to church. And so God is using the pit to demonstrate his power to Joseph. Number three, so first one is loneliness. The second one is doubt. The third thing that you're going to feel if you're going to be a black sheep and you're going to follow Jesus is temptation. Temptation, it's coming. You might as well just like chalk it up. The enemy will try to tempt you, try to kick you when you're down. And so Joseph's brothers decided, hey, we're we're not going to kill him. We're actually going to get him up out of this pit, and we're going to sell him for 20 shekels to Egypt. And so they, they send him off. He's taken by these men to Egypt, and here we pick up the story in Genesis 39, 1 and 2. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, don't forget that name, Potiphar. Everybody say Potiphar. An Egyptian who was one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So he was sold again. And then here it is. The Lord was with Joseph. Somebody say amen. Amen. So that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Now the Bible goes on to say that um, Joseph was well built and handsome. The word of God says that. So ladies, just think Matthew McConaughey, okay? That's Joseph. That's who's playing Joseph in our Hollywood movie, right? Well-built and handsome. Or you can think about me. I don't care what you do. You decide. Two Matthews, you take your choice. You better take me. Nah, I'm kidding. So Potiphar is married to this woman. We'll call her Hotifer, all right? So we got Potiphar is married to Hotifer, and she says to Joseph, Come to bed with me. Hello. I mean, she's married to Potiphar. He, you know, he comes, Joseph comes in, well built. Matthew McConaughey walks in the room and she says, Dang. And Potiphar's like, You can come to bed with me. Now, check this out. Scholars believe that Joseph was anywhere from 18 years old to 22 years old. Now, do you not think that bad boy was tempted? I mean, this man was tempted. I mean, he had this hot chick like right in front. I mean, I know she was married, but it was like his for the taking. And she was inviting him in in that way. And I love what Joseph said to her. Man, I love it. See, we think that Joseph's like all Christian and stuff, and he was like, you know, somehow just said, because I love God, I am not tempted by you. (laughs) Nah. 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 That's how we like to think of it, but that's not how it went down, I assure you, okay? But this is what he said to her. He said, if I did this, it would be a sin against my God. And I just thought, how bold is that? I mean, what 22-year-old men do you know that would be secluded? Nobody's going to find out. You've got this hot chick offering herself to you. We can do this. Make it happen. Nobody's going to see it. Sweep it under the rug. But Joseph knew that his Lord would see it. And he's, he's been through hell already. I mean, you know what I'm saying? He's been through the pit. He's been sold. He's in a, a foreign country. I mean, at that point, there's a lot of men that would just be like, to hell with it. I'm just going to do my thing. Finally get me some, right? I mean... Don't laugh at me. I 
I said it. I'm just trying to be real with you. Amen. Lacey, I'm trying to be real with you over there. Don't put your head down. Act like, Pastor, just say that? Yeah, I did say it. Most men would do that, but he didn't. He treasured God, even in a time where it felt like God didn't treasure him. He never lost his his love for Christ, his love for the God of the Bible. And he said, if I did this, man, it would be a sin against my God. You got to know what your temptations are, right? Because you hit the pit, man, the enemy going to jump you when you're down, when you're in the pit. And you got to know what your temptations are so that you can stand up and have a response like that. That's one of my prayers for you, for our church, that we would not just be people who give way to sin, that we would be people who would be obedient even when it's tough, that we would be say, we would say, nah, that's a sin against God, and I treasure him too much to make that decision. Number four thing that you might experience kind of symbolically is prison when you follow Jesus. There have been times, symbolically, that I feel like I've been in prison. I feel like I've been stuck. I feel like I can't move forward. So Potiphar's wife, this hot woman, doesn't give up her pursuit of Joseph. She just keeps coming at him. And finally, she has one final scheme, and she's like, hey, let's do this. You come to bed with me. And he just totally freaks out and drops his cloak and runs out naked. I mean, this is the first known streaker of all time, okay? Like, I know you think Will Ferrell invented that in old school, but he didn't. Joseph is the first streaker ever. He just, like, leaves his cloak, and he just kind of takes off and runs, which is totally what the Bible says, that, hey, when sin comes your way, you just need to flee from sin, right? Like, just run away. Sometimes you don't have time to talk, you know, because if you stand around too long, you're going to get talked into it. You just got to take off. And that's what Joseph did here. He just took off. The problem is he left his cloak. She comes over, picks up the cloak. She goes to her husband, Potiphar, and claims falsely that Joseph tried to rape her. And now Joseph is like, man, I promise I know I'm naked right now, but like I didn't like, right? Like I I didn't do this. And I actually believe, because you know when somebody's cray, right? I think Potiphar knew his wife was crazy. I think that, and Potiphar ends up throwing Joseph into prison, but I don't think he threw him into prison to punish him. I think he threw Joseph into prison to protect him from his wife because she just kept coming. Like, I think Potiphar knew his wife was crazy. I don't think Potiphar even believed his wife and that story. I just think he was like, Joseph, go to prison and get you out of this situation. How many people know sometimes God will throw you into prison not to punish you, but to protect you? Some good truths coming out today. Genesis 39, 20 says this, Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. What's really cool about this is this prison was a political prison. So it was where, like, all the king's aides and people who made made mistakes in the palace and in the kingdom That's where they would go. And so in this prison, we see that God wasn't punishing Joseph. He was actually preparing him because he threw him into a political prison. Now Joseph gets to learn political structures. He gets to learn how to talk to the Pharaoh. He gets to learn how politics works in and out. And he's in this prison, many scholars believe, from five to seven years. And God's not punishing him. God's preparing him. We read this again in Genesis 39, 21 through 23. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him, never left him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those who held in the prison. So now he's in charge of the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph, there it is again, and gave him success in whatever he did. Number five, and our final thought for today, if you're going to be a black sheep, if you're going to be, you know, a fully devoted follower of Jesus, man, you're going to go after it. You're at times going to feel forgotten. You're going to feel forgotten. So here's how the story continues. 
Joseph's in prison. Two people get thrown into prison with Joseph, a cupbearer and a baker. Kind of weird, right? Sounds like a Disney movie. And so the cupbearer and the baker get thrown into prison with Joseph, and they have dreams. And they're like, man, can anybody interpret these dreams? And Joseph's like, man, I got, I got experience interpreting dreams. And so he interprets the cupbearer's dream. He says, your dream means that you're going to get out in three days, and you're going to be restored back to your rightful place in the palace. For the baker, uh, your dream means that you're going to get out in three days, but they're going to kill you. Okay, and both happens. Okay, and so when he was telling the cupbearer about the dream, he said, "Hey, when you go back to the king's palace, will you tell him about me? Will you tell him there's somebody here who can interpret dreams, and will you tell him to let me out of this prison?" And the cupbearer was like, "Absolutely, sure, I'll do it." And then the Bible says this in Genesis 40:23: the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. If you're going to follow Jesus, at times you're going to feel forgotten. You're going to feel like, man, nobody's kind of looking your way. I mean, how bad does that suck? To think that you're almost out of this prison. This guy's about to go out of here and tell somebody, and you're about to, you know, get out of here, and you sit there for two more years, and you hear nothing. And you just think, man, is anybody, am I ever going to get out of this prison? First it was, am I ever going to get out of the pit? Now it's, am I ever going to get out of this prison? Does God really care about me? Has he forgotten about me? Does he even care what I'm going through? He doesn't care. Don't tell me God loves me and has greater plans for me. Make way. 